they refer to this information later. So we're very glad that you have joined us and um, we'll get started. So our panelists for this topic are my um, very valued colleagues, Jacob Goldberg, Jacob, if you'll wave to everybody so they can put a name and a face, um, who is the manager of the Tulane Recovery Community, and Catherine Tyner, who is the Assistant Dean of Students, and Christopher Zaccarda, who is the Director of the Office of Student Conduct. And I am Penny Wyatt, the Director of Parent Programs, and I'll be moderating tonight. Um, and I will join you again at the end to help moderate the questions. And I'm pleased to just turn things over now to Chris. Thank you, Penny. So again, uh, my name is Chris Sakarna, the Director of Student Conduct, and I've been at Tulane for about four and a half years. And what I'm gonna talk to you tonight about are especially the behavioral expectations that the university has set forth for our students. So every student, undergrad, grad, med student, law student, part-time student, on-campus student, off-campus student, remote student, they all are required to abide by our code of student conduct, which is the university's behavioral expectations that are outlined. Uh, every student should know, every family member should know what those expectations are so that students can stay in good standing and they can make good choices. And so embedded in that code of student conduct, there are several elements that I specifically want to pull out. Not surprisingly, the university has expectations about when and when students cannot use alcohol. Uh, obviously, the state of Louisiana has some laws that guide and dictate the way that we respond to and the way uh, that we allow students to interact with alcohol. So it is against the state law, state statute, as well as against our code of student conduct for students to be in possession and or consume alcohol if they're under the age of 21. That should surprise no one in this audience. The university does um, hold students accountable when they, when they violate that standard. And again, that process is outlined in our code of student conduct. Uh, similarly, with drugs, uh, including marijuana, uh, so it's important for, for students and their families to know that regardless of what the law as it relates to marijuana use or possession is in your home state, in the state of Louisiana, that is still illegal. So it is, with very, very few medically related exceptions, it is illegal to be in possession or to use marijuana. Uh, and even with that being said, it is also against our code of student conduct as well as federal guidelines to be in possession of marijuana on campus. So again, I say that uh, as sort of a, a friendly reminder that things may be different as it relates to drugs or alcohol in Louisiana at Tulane's campus than they may be at your home, your home state or your home city. I especially want to caution, and you know, I say this with as many bells and whistles and red flags as possible, and I say this only because we've had this happen a number of times this year. This wasn't something that I had thought I had to warn families and parents about. But please don't mail your son or daughter or child or student drugs or alcohol. So not only is that a federal crime, but it is a violation of our code of student conduct. Again, even if it's medically prescribed, uh, that, that will cause problems for the student if uh, drugs or alcohol, including marijuana or medical marijuana or marijuana products, are mailed to students uh, at their campus address. Some other things that I wanted to highlight, uh, we do have an expectation for students to be good members of the community. That could be the campus community or a residential community. Uh, so students that will be living in the residence halls, which is the vast majority of our, our freshmen and sophomore, our first and second year students, will be living in residence halls in close quarters, close proximity with other students that are here to learn and grow and develop. And so we expect all of our students to be good community members in those residence halls. But beyond that, because we, we know that one of the main reasons why students come to Tulane is because they want to explore this amazing city called New Orleans. And we want to encourage that. We develop programs to help students explore this wonderful, historic, culturally rich and diverse city that we, that we call home. But it's important for students to be good neighbors, good citizens, 
good ambassadors of Tulane while they're within the local community. And so we do expect our students, whether they're residential or off-campus students, to be good neighbors. Again, good stewards of, those, of that good Tulane name. We also want students to help keep themselves and each other safe. So uh, in essence, uh, being a support when students are in trouble or in danger or are exploring or using drugs or alcohol, uh, that they're trying, trying to do so in a safe way. And, and there are certainly programs that will help students explore how to use alcohol if they choose to use alcohol in, in safe ways. The university does also have what's called a medical amnesty program. And so our amnesty program is designed to encourage students to seek help, um, especially when there is a drug or alcohol related issue. And so what we don't want is we would hate for someone to seek help for themselves or for somebody else because they're afraid they're gonna get in trouble. And so authorized from the Dean of Students in our Code of Student Conduct, um, students that do call for help, call an RA or call for our emergency medical services or call to link police because they feel that someone is in danger or that they themselves are in danger uh, related to drugs or alcohol, the university can grant that medical amnesty so they won't face conduct consequences or conduct action or a judicial record. They may instead uh, be asked or required to do some developmental or some wellness related exploration um, as a result of that, that amnesty call. Um, so again, the last thing we want to do is to prevent or to discourage a student from seeking the help that they may need. Two last things that I want to I share, and that's related to, uh, to our expectation as it relates to hazing. Uh, and the reason why I want to I bring this up specifically is because the state of Louisiana requires that all new students, so whether it's new first year students or other new students, that they are made aware of the state statute, the hazing statute, and the university's expectations. And there are elements of alcohol and drug use, substance use and misuse embedded in that state statute and in our university um, hazing policy, our expectations um, as it relates to affiliation or association with a group, a team, a fraternity or sorority, a club. And that expectation is that as a, a member of that organization, whether it's a new member or an active member, that they are engaging in activities and events that are developmental and supportive of the educational needs of our students. So things like forced consumption of drugs or alcohol, and that's, that's sort of a fancy way of saying making somebody drink, um, that is a crime in the state of Louisiana as a condition of membership for an organization, whether the individuals are underage or not. And so individuals or organizations that are found responsible for that forced consumption, that hazing element of the statute, uh, they face criminal time, serious fines, and mandatory suspension or expulsion from the university. Uh, the victim cannot consent to being hazed. So they, the victim can't say, well, I wanted to chug those beers. I didn't mind that they were yelling at me, that they made me do it. Uh, the, the state law uh, says that the vi a victim cannot consent to a crime like hazing. All new students will take uh, an online course. Uh, it, it may be available as soon as uh, the next couple of weeks. That'll be in their Canvas suite. And that, that online hazing course will explore, again, the university's expectations, not just about alcohol, but about specifically what it means to join an organization and what those expectations uh, for the organization are. So my takeaway is please, 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 I encourage you and your student to review the Code of Student Conduct, make sure that everybody understands what the behavioral expectations are for all of our students so that we can all have a developmental and intellectual and, and healthy and safe experience. So with that, I think next I turn it over to Catherine. Are you next? All right. Thanks, so. Hi, welcome to Tulane. We're excited that you're here with us tonight. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about an office within our uh, within our department called Case Management and Victim Support Services, and our office is there to essentially support students um, throughout their college career and 
you know, like in life at college, there are going to be obstacles and barriers. And so we're, we're there to help students navigate those obstacles and barriers, whether it's mental health issues, substance abuse issues, um, uh, students who have been victims of crime, um, students who are struggling academically for a variety of reasons. Um, we're there to support our students and get them connected with the appropriate resources. We have a ton of resources on campus, and we also have um, a pretty robust um, community of resources with or resources within the community that we're connected with that we can refer students to. One of the pieces um, that intersects with um, this alcohol and other drug presentation is that, like Chris mentioned, if a student is transported for um, alcohol or other drug intoxication, they're transported to the hospital. Our on-call system is going to notify the, the emergency contact, which tends to be apparent. Um, if, if it's emergent, um, they've hit their head, they're unconscious, things like that we call in the moment. Um, so it's usually in the middle of the night. Apologize for those calls ahead of time. Um, if, if it's not, then we just call the next day. But we just want to make you, you know, make you aware that that has happened and kind of what the next steps are. And so like Chris said, if it is a transport and the student didn't engage in um, any other behaviors that would warrant them meeting with conduct, they'll meet with somebody from, from our office, the Dean of Students office. And it's an educational conversation to talk about, you know, what, what was going on. We do want to kind of figure out how much they were drinking, things like that. But then what, what supports do they need? They may, they may not need any supports, but a lot of times they may need you know, some education, they may need connection to a therapist, they may need a substance abuse evaluation, it could be a variety of things, uh, connection to the recovery community. So that again, is a educational and developmental conversation that we're having with those students. Um, and college is a time, you know, a, for many of us, just that age in life is a time where we may be exploring for the first time alcohol um, or other drugs. And so knowing, you know, for the students to know that there are resources for them to reach out to. There are also a lot of programs on campus that are there for students who aren't interested in going out at night and, and partying. Um, so we have things like the Jaunt series, which takes students out into the, you know, greater New Orleans area each week for, you know, it could be rock climbing or it could be a cemetery tour, whatever it may be. There's Tooling After Dark, which has programming um, three or four nights a week in the Lab and Burnick Center, which is the student center. Um, again, trivia, movies, a variety of different things that don't involve alcohol. And then just, you know, finding, meeting other people um, who also may not be interested in, in that drinking um, through things like the freshman leadership program or becoming a peer mentor or um, joining an intramural sports team. So there, there are a variety of ways for students um, to have a good time here and not drink. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jacob to tell you about our amazing recovery community. Thanks, Catherine. And um, thanks everyone again for logging on to, to view the webinar and to participate. I also want to take the opportunity while I have the mic, uh, just to extend my congratulations to you and your family and your student for making it to Tulane. Um, so as I was introduced, again, my name is Jacob Goldberg. I'm a clinical social worker and a licensed addiction counselor. And I will talk to you guys about the recovery community, but I also wanna to talk to you a little bit more about uh, well-being build upon uh, some of the topics that, that, that Catherine um, um, so eloquently stated uh, before. Um, so one of the things that um, I wanted to 
to, to, to start with was that um, your student um, will, will have some of these um, pre-matriculation online module programming that they're gonna have to do before they come, um, before they get to campus, as, um, as Chris mentioned, um, with the hazing. There is, uh, there's one labeled alcohol and other drugs. They're gonna receive that in, in July. Um, you, I'm not sure the cadence of this, and so Penny may correct me, uh, but you, you may have already received, or you, you will receive um, a guide um, that's specifically tailored for, for parents to have discussions around alcohol. And I would um, highly encourage you to, uh, to have those conversations and use some of those um, talking points um, as, a, as an opportunity to, to talk about what it's, what it's like for, for your student to individuate and come down here to New Orleans and have to start making decisions for themselves and um, what um, uh, maybe some, some opportunities to, to kind of debt um, their decision making. Um, and I would also encourage you to continue to have those conversations as things come up throughout, throughout their, their first year and through their um, experience here at Tulane. We, we're, gonna inundate, we're already inundating you guys with a lot of information. We do that with students as well. There's many opportunities for, um, for folks to be able to, to get the information that they need. Um, orientation is a big piece of that. Uh, one of the major programs that we do in, uh, during orientation is called Live Well at TU. And it's, uh, it's about an, an, an hour um, in, uh, engaging opportunity led by other peers um, at the university um, to talk about the basics of alcohol and, and other substances how they can make healthy decisions around that um, and how they may um, intervene on a friend if they have um, a peer that may be, may be struggling or they're concerned about. Um, and then during the academic year, we have, we have programming as, um, as Catherine mentioned, um, that is really peppered throughout the week and, and doesn't stop uh, for folks to have alternative options as opposed to um, if that, it's not their decision not to drink or that's not something they you know, don't want to be hyper-focused around a centered uh, engagement around alcohol. Um, uh, one of our, our, our lead uh, um, opportunities here that we're super proud of is called um, our Tufts. Um, you can hear a lot of acronyms here at Tulane. This is uh, the Tulane um, University Peer Health Educators, and it's a group of uh, student-led um, uh, individuals that are dedicated uh, to working in different topic areas, and they lead workshops throughout the throughout the year. They um, go into residence halls and have opportunities for training. Um, they have pop up um, uh, tents that are pe again peppered out throughout the, the actual environment of the university to talk have opportunities to talk about engaging issues that may come up. Um, we do a lot of social media. Uh, uh, posts from our various departments to be able to, one, be able to um, have some quick tips around managing stress, anxiety, uh, mental health, all the, all the, the things that fall under just well-being. Um, and of course, we do one of the, another, another uh, media form that we connect with is that, that I was surprised to hear that students really, really enjoy and, and, and consume is our Stall Street Journal. Uh, so we we have uh, we have wellness points in in the bathroom. So while they're in the bathroom, they can read something. They, they can find some some resource on campus. Um, we have a full dedicated staff that works in health promotion, specifically targeting well-being um, outreach. And again, this is where our Tulane Peer Health Educators fall under that staff. So if your um, if your student is interested in in, in, in joining um, that cohort, uh, there will be opportunities for them. To explore that. Um, we specifically try to have more programming around high risk times, historically high risk times, uh, one being Mardi Gras, uh, Halloween, when folks are turn, um, coming of age to legally consume alcohol, um, and um, in spring break. Um, let's see. Uh, and, and a big piece that if you haven't already kind of heard this is that we uh, we really value relationships here in New Orleans and here at Tulane um, and taking care of one another. So we um, it's, we we really um, talk about bystander intervention and opportunities to 
if you see something to do something and, and, and then you don't have to act alone. And there's a, as Catherine said, and as we were going to share with you, there's a lot of inter, a lot of resources, professional resources to reach out to be able to, um, to help support um, anyone who is, is, is going through uh, whatever problematic um, uh, issue that has come up. Um, so I'll kind of switch gears a little bit to some of our early intervention strategies and then talk about um, the recovery community. I'm, let me be mindful of my time here. I think I got uh, four minutes left. So um, uh, some of our early intervention strategies, again, these have kind of been mentioned. Um, Chris mentioned this as um, we have a couple different um, uh, opportunities for students, one being um, a platform called eCheckup to go uh, which is an online self-guided practice. Um, um, uh, opportunity for a student to um, have some um, a, a means of taking a look at some of their consumption behavior and what that relationship looks like and then safety around that. Um, a, maybe a little step ahead of that is uh, what's called our, our basics program, which is brief alcohol screening intervention for college students. Um, and that uses a validated tool, uh, screening tool with feedback, and then has the opportunity um, and, um, to meet with the with the staff um, or graduate student um, that lives within my office. And we found that it, it works a lot better when our, when our students are talking to older peers as opposed to old people with no hair like myself. So um, they, if, it, if, it, if it is uh, elevated to the point where we need to talk to a professional staff that, that is built into our programming, but uh, we see a, a lot of great um, opportunities to make some, some changes if there's been some um, uh, pro problematic issues previously through that uh, program and working with um, another student. Um, um, we um, so uh, next space is really to talk about what the Tulane Recovery Community is, and that's uh, that's my main main piece of my job. And uh, the Tulane Recovery Community is uh, sports students who are in recovery. Um, from substance use disorders or have identified that they're having a problematic relationship with alcohol or other substances. We also support students who may have a close family member or friend that has been impacted by substance use, addiction, or any other problem problematic behaviors. Um, this, uh, this is, we're still relatively novel um, on campus. Uh, we formed in January of 2020, and uh, we offer three meetings uh, a week. Um, um, one being a, an AA meeting on Monday night, an all recovery meeting being on Tuesday night with dinner, and we have a yoga and recovery meeting on Friday night. We do social events um, throughout uh, at least one scheduled social event, event once a month. Um, we're there for homecoming. We tailgate for homecoming um, with the substance free uh, opportunity for tailgating. We've gone bowling. We've done fishing trips. We've done canoeing with our campus rec folks and camping trips. Um, and we have all alternative options during high risk times. Um, specifically this year, uh, we had the, the great opportunity to take some students on a ski trip during Mardi Gras to get out of town and then uh, Pensacola for spring break where we had sober spring break. So um, programming, um, again, this is programming for students that, that again, is, choose not to drink or may um, um, have identified that they have a, have a problematic behavior uh, our relationship with any kind of substance. Um, my, uh, my, I'm also available at, at, in any capacity. Again, my, I'm, I'm a life clinical social worker and I can help, help, help in some capacities and then also help connect to all the other wonderful resources that we have on campus, Catherine's office, um, Chris's office, and then of course our counseling department. And then if, it, if things become a little more uh, that we can't, we can't handle, we, we make sure to find those resources within our community or back home with you guys. So um, my, I think all, most of our information will be, be shared, but um, just for, to, to plug, plug my gig is uh, you can Google me, my name and my um, contact information is readily available on our campus health website. And I'd be happy to connect with you offline if you have any, um, have any questions or concerns or just want to chat. So um, thank you for the time. I look forward to hearing from, from you guys. Pass it to Penny. Okay. So we just have one slide here to show you that um, while we are giving you a lot of this information right now, we want you to understand that the students will be immersed in our community and be receiving this information from you know, these 
online modules that they'll do before they even arrive. So they'll do those in July. Um, and then there'll be some targeted programs for the new students during new student orientation. So those are those days between move in and August 21st. And so we've mentioned a couple of those things, but it doesn't stop there. So they always have the access to these university departments that have been mentioned from these different colleagues. And then those services and outreach and signature programs just continue on through um, the year. And then we've listed um, some of these student paraprofessional or mentor roles um, where we have students helping other students. So we just wanted you to be able to see those. For the students, this will all start to kind of fit together the longer you're here with us and you're a part of the um, community. But for parents, we wanted you to just be able to kind of see at a glance these different things. So we'll be making these um, slides available on the um, Parent Programs website and you'll be able to um, catch up with those things. So we wanna just um, tell you now is the time to submit your questions and I'll help um, moderate those and our panelists will, will provide some answers. So if you wanna start typing in, please go ahead and start doing that. Oh, um, one question already I'll pose to the panelists. So what happens if a student is slipped a date rape drug in a non-alcoholic beverage and ends up being transported to the hospital? How would one test for that? And what are the consequences of that? Uh, actually, both of these questions that have been posted, I, I can probably answer. Uh, so if a student has slipped a date rape drug, whether it's in an alcoholic drink or a non-alcoholic drink, um, again, we, we encourage students to reach out for help. And so it is not unusual for our Tulane uh, Emergency Medical Services, our student-run organization, to transport those individuals to the hospital. When the hospitals know in advance, they can test for certain kinds of intoxicants that have been dropped into alcohol. Now, and not, not every situation they're going to know in advance or the individual that has been drugged may not know to ask for that in advance. We have been trying to work with local hospitals so that if they have reason to believe when someone comes in that they are a Tulane student um, or that they may have been drugged, that they may run some basic drug panels uh, but because we don't control all of the hospitals in the city of New Orleans, we, you know, we don't have 100% success rate with being able to get tested. And those tests have to be done pretty quickly because a lot of them can be, uh, they can be flushed from the system pretty quickly. Um, in terms of consequences, again, these would all fall under the medical amnesty policy. So for the individual that has been drugged, the, there would be no conduct consequences. They would likely meet with someone from the university um, that may very well be someone from um, from um, Catherine's area, or it could be someone from Jacob's area, but it would not be uh, a, a hearing from the Office of Student Conduct. Uh, if, if it is learned that an individual did the drugging, uh, so on the other end of that equation, if we have reason to believe that it was a student that did the drugging, then that student would face a very severe conduct process and would likely face suspension or expulsion from the university uh, if they're found responsible for deliberately incapacitating another, another student. Uh, the second question that's been posed that I think is for me, can you please discuss the use of drugs or alcohol in the dorms? Um, again, as I had said at the very beginning, we are required to abide by the Louisiana state law as it relates to alcohol. Uh, so alcohol can be used in the residence halls with two notable exceptions. I mean, the most notable is uh, the student has to be 21 or older in order to possess and or use alcohol in the residence halls. There may be periods of time during uh, the academic year that the university will declare what's called a high priority or a state of emergency. And that could happen for a variety of different reasons. Uh, we often will create this high priority time during orientation so that students can focus on becoming oriented to the university without distraction, without fear of, of being dragged to parties or invited uh, or having alcohol uh, distract their, their mission for learning about Tulane and the resources, um, or if there's inclement weather. Uh, so for instance, uh, New Orleans is no stranger to inclement weather for hurricanes. So during periods of, of hurricane or hurricane watch or tropical storms, the university may also declare a high priority period. During those high priority periods, we are a dry campus. So even those students that are 21 and living in the residence halls, they may not possess or use alcohol during those high priority periods. Otherwise, if they are 21, yes, they are allowed to have alcohol and use alcohol for themselves. 
If they provide alcohol to a minor, that is again against the law as, a, as well as against the code of student conduct. Uh, the consequences can range from uh, educational consequences like some of the programs that Jacob described, the online uh, alcohol awareness courses like eCheckup or like Basics. Uh, there could be some what we call status, which could be warning or disciplinary probation. Uh, a disciplinary probation period means for a finite period that student is not in good standing. Uh, there may be fines, there may be community service if there are other uh, like vandalism or other, uh, other mitigating factors. Uh, so there could be both some developmental or educational consequences, as well as some status related consequences for violating our drug or alcohol policy. So Chris, another question I think would be for you, um, or and perhaps um, any of the other panelists, how are students educated about reducing the rate of being a victim of a date rape drug? What are they taught? You know, um, I can step in with that for at least, at least to start and then pass it off to you, to you guys. I think um, part of, um, um, of a lot of our, our training and orientation is talking about, although again, you know, we're, we're not encouraging alcohol use for someone under the age of 21. We understand that um, that happens and uh, we want to encourage healthy or harm reduction um, consumption if the, if, the, if the student chooses to do so. And uh, part of that is we go through a, a training with folks on um, if they choose to drink, um, what are some um, steps or some ways to mitigate um, this, uh, the, the, the opportunity or, um, you know, the, being a victim of uh, being slipped some sort of medication or some sort of substance that may, uh, that they don't, they don't want, or that whatever it may be, if we're going to call it a date rate drug, there's a lot of different other substances out there. And so part of that is uh, talking about um, where you get your, when you get your, where you get your alcohol, watching it, getting it poured from the, if you're at a bar, making sure someone else doesn't get a drink for you, um, making sure that um, you are with your drink at all times. It's really simple stuff like that to help try to um, try to impede upon um, an, an opportunity that, that could, could be detrimental if um, in, in an outcome. And, um, so again, we, we, we do that um, through orientation. Um, we do that through a lot of different um, learning vessels that um, our peer health educators do. And, and of course, we also, um, through our social media platforms, we are constantly talking about alcohol choices and healthy ways to stay safe around alcohol. And that doesn't just include like not drinking to the point of intoxic uh, to, to blackout or drinking too much, it's including being safe with your consumption and with your drink and where you're getting your drinks from. And that, that is a, a place that place where we start. Um, I don't know if, it, if Catherine or Chris, you want to add to that in any capacity. I think you, you answered it completely. Thank you. A related question is, is there a kit that a student can have in their room to test for such type of drugs? I, I can start with that too as well. There's a lot of stuff um, online you can get. Um, they have different testing um, kits, so, uh, um, so to speak, uh, to be able to test for different various substances. The, I would say um, that is an option, I suppose, but I, it's, unfortunately it's not 100% because the, where the state we're in and um, are just the, uh, it's not the state, the uh, the, the world we're living in right now, there's so many different types of substances and um, all kinds of research chemicals, and all these things that keep start coming out. And so we don't have necessarily tests to, that will be able to uh, identify all those substances 100%. So you know, I would hate to say, yes, go buy one, something online at Amazon that says that it tests for uh, date rate drugs and then a student student um, is still drugged in some ways because they're relying upon this. This is definitely a, a, a means of mitigation, but it, it's not 100%, it's not feel safe. Um, and I, I, again, I, I let, let my colleagues respond if they have anything else. The only thing that I'll add is that the university does not provide any kind of kit like that um, where we would hand out. We don't, give, we don't have a kit like that, a product like that, that we would give to RAs. Uh, okay, so another question. Um, 
a comment first that this particular person says they're fully on board with our policy, um, but they are asking about um, asking for help in explaining the weed world on Canal Street and how to keep students away from that. So, um, anybody want? Let's to hear from Catherine on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Weed World and the vans that drive around, they're all over the country. Um, so essentially, I think the, the, you know, the lollipops with the marijuana next to them and all that is marketing. Um, what I think, believe what they're selling is CBD products, which do not contain THC. They also may be selling something um, called uh, Delta 8 which is, tell, which is uh, another, again, here we are with new products that are coming out that uh, kind of squeeze through uh, the, the legal system. Um, and they call it uh, uh, cannabis or weed because it's a tetrahydrocannabinoid delta eight, um, tetrahydrocannabinoid delta nine is what uh, most people consider weed. Um, so there is this alternative that is um, derivative from a, a um, the hemp plant and they get around the loophole of uh, legality by naming it something else and it's not cannabis. So it's, uh, you know, it's here in New Orleans, I think it, in most major cities, most everywhere there is, there is we're, we're shifting to kind of integrate this into our culture and understand where the limitations are and um, having to talk about it and be um, clear. And that's one of the reasons why we're here talking to you guys about it, because it's, um, it, it's not something we can hide from. And uh, we want to try to inform and educate and um, dissuade as much as possible from, from, from negative outcomes. So another question is, do you have to declare non-marijuana prescription drugs? And if we need to ask this person to clarify that question by typing in some more information, you let me know. Um, does anybody wanna tackle that question? Yeah. Again, assuming that we understand the, the question correctly, no, if a student is has a prescription medication that they're using for ADHD or they have a, a cold or a, an infection, no, they're not required to register that with the university. They may end up getting it through the university's health center, but no, if they, if they come with a, a regular registered prescription, they're not required to notify the university, but they don't get in trouble. But again, they may, they may seek assistance uh, with our health center. Or decide to move the prescription to the pharmacy at our health center so that they can um, get it that way. So here's another question. Could you please comment on the state law vis-a-vis -vis those who are underage who could have someone of age provide them with an alcoholic? Yeah, the, the Louisiana law is, is somewhat unique. It doesn't apply in this setting. So the way the Louisiana law is written is a family member can give alcohol to an underage individual in their home setting. Um, that doesn't apply onto campus. So a 22 year old cannot legally provide alcohol either through the law or through our, our campus policies to an individual that is under the age of 21. Here's a question that's again, sort of about our, our larger community environment. Is it normal that underage students are able to go off campus to the French Quarter, for example, to be served alcohol? Yeah, I mean, so students can can go anywhere, um, and many do go to the French Quarter. Um, but again, the like Chris said, the the code of conduct applies everywhere. The medical amnesty applies everywhere. Um, <clears throat> so this all comes into this prevention and education work that many of our offices do about safety. How you know, and and we're an urban city, and so how to be safe when going places, um, you know, travel with friends, don't leave your group, make sure your phone is charged, those types of things, um, as well as the, the education we provide on drinking. Um, it's illegal for a bar to serve somebody who's underage. Um, it does happen. Um, I, I would assume it happens in most places, but um, again, it's that education education piece. And we have had students that are cited by police 
And they have to go through that police citation process, which can include under certain circumstances, an actual arrest, whether it's in the quarter or whether it's in the garden district where Tulane is. So here's another question um, or a request. Please calm a parent's fears based on hearing about the prevalence um, of illicit drugs, especially cocaine on campus. Anyone want to? From a code perspective, I will say it, it is illegal. It is against not only uh, Louisiana state law, but against the code of student conduct to be in possession of illicit drugs, including cocaine. Um, if students are found to be in possession of cocaine, uh, that is likely a suspendable offense. Anybody else want to add anything? I mean, I'm going to go back to the education, right? Um, it's not unique to Tulane's campus. This is college campuses. Um, and, you know, like we mentioned previously, this can be an age where, where, where people are exploring um, a variety of different things. And so, again, it's that education piece. And I, again, to kind of piggyback on, on Catherine's um, share is that, uh, you know, my experience, so I've, I've worked, um, Prior to coming to Tulane, I've been I've worked in addiction medicine um, treatment facilities for for 15 years, and uh, just in those 15 years, I've seen um, accessibility go up uh, tremendously with the um, advent of the dark web. And you know that's like our our our, our students are, are very bright and uh, they're able to obtain things, um, and that's that kind of this this population here. Uh, this generation is um, is dealing with this, and so this is a this is a subject that comes off where wherever uh, the student is going, and we um, we do our best to inform and educate, and again and enforce um, uh, the uh, the laws of the state, and then of course the the, the code of conduct within the university. But then um, one of the things that I'm super proud of here at Tulane is that we're we're we as Chris mentioned we're willing to help people when they ask for it. And it's not a punitive space. Uh, where as if, if someone makes a mistake at maybe a different university, um, there it's, there's no, no, uh, no talking about it. It's just completely you're kicked out. So um, we, uh, we acknowledge we wanna try to um, um, limit uh, substance use and uh, those illegal substances on campus. And we uh, dissuade that. It's going to come up in some capacities, and we want to be able to have resources to intervene on that and to support students should they have any issues or should they be concerned with somebody if they're seeing um, uh, consumption happen and and they don't know what to do or they're not they're not comfortable with that. So we are we are here to support them and we're here to um, try to um, change the narrative in that capacity. So another question is, what about the poppers? I keep seeing photos I've been hearing about. Um, they're thinking that's the correct term. But yeah, I'm assuming common. that question is related to whippets. Um, perhaps that's the the more you know vernacular slang that, that students are using now. Uh, whippets are prohibited on campus, both in the residence halls as well as um, uh, at our our events, at our off campus uh, fraternity parties, sorority parties, for instance. Um, so while yes, we do recognize that just like other illicit or illegal drug activity, there are students that choose to engage in in um, using whippets, again, that is prohibited and there are programs to help students understand the dangers of that. And we would certainly hope that students, if they see their friends doing it, that they would stop it and or help that student get the help that they need. Um, using whippets can be damaging, both short-term and long-term. Uh, if, if, if I'm not answering it correctly, if, if poppers isn't the same as whippets, then you know I'm not quite sure. It's, but that's that's what I think you're asking about. I think they can be there. There is something separate from a whippet cutter, they're a popper, um, but they are very they're inhalants and they're short term and they're very similar in um, in what uh, what the what what um, how they're used and 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 then um, what um, what the experience is for the person using them. Um, and again, they've been this isn't a, a new phenomenon. Um, Poppers have been, whippets have been around since the 60s, and we just kind of na changed names, and we're, 
Um, now they're discussed and they're illegal. They're, they are legal to purchase because they're not meant for consumption. And um, that's not what their market it is. And we still have, um, so we still have to deal with that, right? And that's one of the things we, um, we talk about. Um, one of, a lot of our campaigns that come from our health promotion department and from um, our prevention department is to talk about these things, name them, and um, talk about the ill effects from them. Um, and again, talk about opportunities for, for support or interventions for, for individuals if they're concerned. How does Tulane address alcohol safety as it's related to sexual assault that may be related to or fueled by alcohol? We talked a little about this last week in our other webinar, um, but there is an acknowledgement um, when we are talking about sexual assault pre prevention, sexual violence prevention, that alcohol does play into that often. And it's also built into the questions that are part of our climate survey. Um, does anybody want to um, address that? Question? The only thing that I'll, I'll, I'll add that, again, I, I would encourage parents and family members to watch last week's webinar, because I think the answer that we got from the well from that area was, was really solid. Um, but we, we help students explore, if they choose to use alcohol, we help them explore it, how do you do it safely? And so whether that's protecting themselves from crime or from injury or from assault or sexual assault, again, I think those skills can be applied across, across the gamut in, in making sure that they're, again, they're staying within their limits, that they're staying cognizant or aware of their surroundings, um, I think that skill set translates across um, a variety of different uh, potentially dangerous dangerous behaviors. So, um, can anybody um, comment on um, this question? How common is it for um, students to be slipped a, a drug in a drink um, like that? You know, is it something to be aware about? Would you consider it rampant? How would you characterize that here? Do I think it's rampant? No. Uh, again, uh, Catherine and I see every single report that comes through the university. And, and so we can, we can count usually in, in one month the number of reports in which a student is actually drugged. Um, we can count those, those numbers, those reports probably on one or two hands in, in any given month. Uh, now, there may be times where a student thinks he or she may be drugged, but it turns out well, no, I wasn't drugged. I just had 10 shots of tequila. And so that's why it turns out I blacked out. Um, again, if we can get actual results, toxicology results from the hospital, then that certainly helps us in terms of how we respond and support that student. But no, I, I would not say, I would say the number of individuals that are drugged, that are actually drugged, either at a campus bar, on campus, or at a campus party is a fraction, a small, small, small fraction of our student population. It's too late. Oh, go ahead, Catherine, I'm sorry. Not a campus bar, bar near a campus. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> and sometimes it feels like they're on campus, but thank you. For that. And, and you might have said campus parties too, but a, a party on campus would not be serving alcohol unless everyone was a 21, but it could be parties close by campus that are right. You have campus parties that are registered that may happen either adjacent to campus or at an off-campus venue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and oftentimes parents, those types of, they, they are held at off-campus venues so that there is somebody there to abide by all the laws and check IDs and do all those things. And so um, it's, it's better that they, that the student organizations that would want to hold something like that do it with a, a venue so that all of those policies can be followed and all the state laws can be followed. Um, so another question is, um, does Tulane educate students or raise awareness about, the, about counterfeit prescription pills like Xanax that are now being pushed online that contain um, fentanyl and are causing deaths and other um, serious consequences? Resoundingly, yes. And I think we are absolutely allocating more resources because this is a new, a relatively new phenomenon that is that is happening, and we're seeing an uptick of that just nationally. Is um, there will be more campaigns um, and 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 more awareness opportunities um, around that subject area? Um, 
particularly. Um, two a couple of quick ones, I think. Are vaping and tobacco products allowed on campus and in dorms? It is prohibited to smoke or vape on campus. Anywhere, residence hall, outside, academic building, office building, you cannot smoke or vape anywhere on two-lane property. And Jacob, I believe that you touched on this, but a question is, is there a support group for students who have a sibling, a friend, or a parent? Absolutely. We have an all recovery meeting, which is a non-denominational recovery meeting on Tuesday nights. And we also have dinner and it then wasn't a residence hall. And uh, I'll share this in here because it's actually happening is that um, we, the university has invested in a, um, a recovery community uh, center, which will be a house adjacent to campus that backs up the campus. And we will have more programming coming out of that. And then an opportunity for um, uh, residents uh, that are in recovery for substance-free housing in that capacity as well. So I think if we I jump down to elaborate housing opportunities for, for students uh, who do not use alcohol, again, as uh, Dr. Zaccardo said, is like alcohol is prohibited in the dorms. Con consumption is not um, allowed unless you're of age of 21. Um, and, and so there is, uh, we do our best to promote and, and to enforce those policies is that, that there shouldn't um, there shouldn't be alcohol in the dorms for, for someone who's 18, 19 years old. Um, am I getting that right, Chris? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so Chris, someone was picking up on something you had mentioned earlier. So what would suspension entail? So a suspension is a separation from the university for a finite period, usually a, a minimum of one semester. And those are for behavioral reasons or for academic misconduct. Uh, again, if the allegations are, are, are found to be um, true and the student is found responsible and the allegations are severe. During that period of suspension, that student cannot live on campus, that student is not enrolled at, in a two-lane program, and that student cannot transfer credits into the university during that, that punishment period of suspension. An expulsion is permanent. So whereas a suspension is for, again, one semester, one year, an expulsion is a permanent separation, meaning that individual can never enroll, can never set foot on Tulane's campus for eternity. Those are incredibly rare. So we're, we're almost wrapping up. So um, it's almost time to wrap up. So there's a couple of final questions that we'll take. Um, so one question is, are there any self-defense classes that are offered on campus that students can take? Um, do you suggest that would be a good idea to take before starting their first year? So our um, Department of Public Safety does um, periodically offer a self-defense course. Would any of you like to just talk, answer this question more generally here? I don't, I don't know. I know in previous years when I was here, they, they offer something. I'm not sure if they still do. I think that during COVID, because the, the, the model of self-defense class that they taught was very, very hands-on, we actually practiced particular skills. That was not something they were, could do during um, social distancing during COVID. I think that um, you know, in talking with other staff around this issue, um, we're really kind of addressing a lot of other behaviors and um, in terms of trying to curb sexual misconduct, you know, and avoid that. And so it also, that is in trying to reach the potential perpetrators of sexual violence, rather than kind of focusing on um, what potential victims could do or not do. And so it's just a different kind of mindset around that. So um, I think that if you would like to go back and look at that um, website, the webinar that we had last week. It is on the parent program's website. So the um, recording is there and the allied resources that were mentioned. So um, this question is a great segue um, for, um, for us. Do we have any advice on how to have a very constructive conversation with your, your student about this topic before you leave home? What are the best questions to ask or comments to make? That is exactly why we're holding this particular series. And um, Catherine put into the chat box the link to a wonderful guide. And so we'll show you that here too. Um, so our um, 
Health Promotion Unit, the, the WELL, um, which is a part of Campus Health, put together this parent guide. It's called the Tulane Parent Guide for talking with your student about alcohol. So when you, um, if you'll look in the chat, you can capture the link to that, um, but we'll also post this on the Parent Program's website under the, the webinars and tutorials page. So it's a good handbook. It's a few pages, but it's got good background information and then some great questions or sort of conversation starters that you can use. So we are happy to provide this for you and have you look over that and have that conversation with your student um, before they even arrive. So we do really strongly recommend that. And um, we just want to um, remind you, you'll be able to find those things on the website there. Um, and then we have one more webinar in this series of Tulane Talks for New Students and Families, and that'll be next Monday. That one will be about academics, opportunities, integrity, and support. And the, there are other parent webinars coming up um, on dining services, emergency preparedness and response, and, and general emergency preparedness. And we'll have a few more um, over the summer before the school year starts, and those will be announced in the um, parent e-newsletter. And then we continue to have um, webinars throughout the academic year. And so I saw someone ask if there might be an opportunity for an eating disorders webinar. So I'm always open to parents suggesting other topics. So please feel free to do that. You can send feedback about this webinar um, and I will forward that on to my colleagues here who've been panelists, um, or you can um, comment about the webinars in general or suggest a topic for a future, um, future event. So please do that and you can do that really easily through email just to parents, plural, parents at Tulane.edu. So if you have any feedback you'd like to offer right now in the um, Q&A box, um, just about tonight's webinar, you're welcome to type that in really quickly before we close. Um, I would like to thank all of our panelists for being a part of this experience tonight. Thank you so much for your expertise and your commitment and your time this evening. And then parents and students, we're really grateful that you joined us and that you're interested in um, learning more about um, how to approach this and get prepared kind of emotionally and intellectually to tackle these, um, these topics, to get prepared for these experiences and begin that before you arrive. So um, we're grateful that you're interested in that. So um, with that, I will close and um, tell everybody to just please um, have a good evening and join us for the future talk. And we'll say good night. Endless if you wanna. Hey, good night. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys.